Hey lovely freaks and welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host Amanda. And I'm Hannah. And if you like things strange and unusual and you're new here, hi, welcome. You can go ahead and hit that subscribe button. You can also follow us where you're listening to your podcast and you can go down to our description box and you can find our um, social media info where we are on Instagram, Facebook, all that jazz. And all that jazz. And we also, um, yeah, on in- on Instagram, it's at Lovely Freaks Podcast. So we kind of changed it to was just Lovely Freaks, but now it's Lovely Freaks Podcast. Okay. So anyways, if you guys are wondering, yes, I was sick Wednesday. Um, that's why we didn't do an episode. I posted that on our Instagram. So if you're not on our Instagram, you should be because that's where we like share all the info and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um. But I'm fine. No Rona. She was negative. So she she was, she negative. was negative. She wasn't in this in this body. But anyways, if I'm stuffy and all that, I apologize. There will be breaks we will be taking. Um, just you know, so I can get water and stuff like that. And those will be the times that Hannah will interject. And I'll just be like, eh, um, um. <laughs> yeah. Do you know? Do you know? Yeah. <laughs> so today. We are talking about uh, the Moores murders, Ian Brady and Myra Henley. So this is actually from our brethren across the pond in England. This is in England. So the Moores murders took place between 1963 and 1965 in Saddleworth Moors. And it's kind of like... Manchester, England, in that area. Mm -hmm. So, the moors are, like, open plains, and they're filled with, like, rocks and marsh and um, just, they're very, very vast. I can't remember how many acres there are, but it's, like, it's, it's basically, it would be, like, I'm trying to think, like, the Everglades in Florida, like, the swamp areas, but it's not swamps, but... It's that big is what I mean. So, um, yeah, we're just gonna, we're gonna dive right in. Uh, the victims in this case were between the ages of 10 and 17. So, full disclaimer, there is children, um, being murdered in this case. If that's something that you cannot handle hearing, um, you could kind of skip through it because there's not really any graphic graphic details that I'm going to talk about. I'm just going to explain, you know, how they died and all that. I'm not somebody, I don't really like talking about details of children. Um, yeah. So I just kind of will let you know what happened and then go I'm on. Sure no one else wants to hear that too. So yeah. Um, one of the murders though is pretty rough just simply because it was videotaped or it was recorded mm-hmm. And there was a lot of things that happened in that one. But we're not going to get to that one today. But, um, so yeah, we, this will be two parts, unfortunately. I know I said that I don't like doing two parts, but you know, when it comes to serial killers, it's kind of has, it just has to happen. There's just a lot of information and you don't want to leave anything out. Yeah, we don't want a two hour video kind of thing. Yeah. And we don't want to leave anything out. We don't want to leave any victims like, you know out either or leave details out about the victims like how they were as people and and, and as people I don't know why I said that how they were when they were alive (laughs) there we go they are people um but yeah so it's gonna be a two-parter sorry about it but let's get let's get into this so Myra and Ian first we're gonna talk about Myra Henley So, Myra and Elin, we'll get to when they meet and what happens when they meet each other, but, um, we're just going to talk about her and then we'll, we'll talk about Ian, like their backstory, you know? Yeah. So, Myra Henley was nicknamed, her nickname was, she was, like, everybody in Britain considered her the most evil woman in Britain and actually Ian was considered the most evil man in Britain as well and you'll understand why. Oh, yeah, thought, but for the murder. Oh, I most you meant evil. No, 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 like, no. Oh, so everyone just knows him. Like, no, I know, like, oh, he's so evil. Yeah, no, like they don't. They consider him after like yeah, the murders. Like one of the most 
horrific crimes that had happened. Yeah. In the 1960s. And so. Um, she was born July 23rd, 1942 in Manchester. Her parents are Nellie and Bob Henley. Her father was a soldier in World War II. And I believe he was in the Army. He also was like a championship boxer in the war as well. Mm -hmm. Um, When he came back, so her and her sister Maureen and her mom, they all lived with her grandmother. And their situation was kind of like, you know, like mom and dad. Like they, like how we lived beside them. Yeah. When we used to live beside them. And that's kind of what happened. When he got back from the Army... They moved into a house, like, right across the street from her grandparents. Um, But her grandmother was, like, really kind and and all that. Her dad, I would say, suffered from PTSD because he did become, like, a severe alcoholic. Um, Although, there's not any, like, he was abusive, but I don't know that he abused her. Let me fully explain. So, he would drink and he would get violent with the mom. And they would start fighting and they would argue and all that. So the grandmother decided she didn't want them to be in that environment. So they, like, came up with a plan because the parents were like, well, we still want to see our kids. We don't want you to take our kids away. So she said, okay, why don't I take the girls at night? Because usually the dad would, like, go out to the bars at night and get drunk and then come home and be, you know, loud and whatever and fight with the mom. So the grandmother said, I'll take them at night, like, after dinner and they could sleep at my house and then during the day they'll just come over there and you know hang out with their parents and so that's what they did they would spend all day with their mom and dad or you know go to school then come home spend the day they would eat dinner and then after dinner they would go to their grandmother's um then the dad would go to a pub or whatever and get wasted that's kind of shitty though like he couldn't just say well i'll just give up alcohol you know yeah well apparently i mean he was suffering as well. PTSD like wasn't a thing then, but, I mean, yeah. he was in World War II, so I'm sure he saw um, some shit. Some, yeah, like, serious so. shit. Um, so, Myra lies a lot. She's a piece of trash. They both are, Ian and Myra. But she lies a lot. Sometimes, over the years, she's dead now, but sometimes over the years, she would say that her dad did abuse her, but then she would say... Like, some accounts, she would be like, yeah, my dad would abuse me, like, every night when he'd come come home. He would be drunk, and he would hit me, and he would hit my mom and my sister. Yeah. But then other times, she would say, no, my dad never let a hand on me. It was just whenever he needed to spank me when I did something bad. So, yeah, it's just back and forth okay. bullshit. Um, but the truth about him being an alcoholic is true. And about fighting with the mom, that really is true because the grandmother, like, is, like, for sure that happened. So, neither one of these people that we're going to talk about, Myra and Ian, the murderers, they didn't really have a shitty childhood. Not not really awful. Like, it wasn't Richard Ramirez, you know, where he saw somebody get shot and he saw these pictures of people's heads being cut off. Like, it wasn't like that. It was actually kind of pretty normal. So, the one thing about Myra, though, is she was taught violence at a very early age but it was to defend herself so her dad would teach her like how to box like he would go in the backyard and he would teach her how to box so she could defend herself later so it was known early on that Myra was like a fighter like everybody knew okay you don't mess with Myra because she's gonna fight you she wasn't a bully actually she would fight the bullies for other kids so I thought that was really nice of her and how it kind of happened Sorry. How it kind of happened was, um, one day she went, she was at school and she got into a fight with some boy. He hit her. She ran back home and cried to her dad. And her dad was like, if you don't go stand up for yourself and like basically kick his ass, I'm going to spank you. And so I thought that was a little strange. Yeah, that was weird. And so she did. She like went back to the school kicked the boy's ass and from that day on everybody was like okay you don't mess with Myra she's like you know she's tough she can take care of herself kind of situation um so Myra also one thing that did happen that kind of I wouldn't say like attributed to her being crazy or whatever 
I don't really know what attributed to her. Oh, I kind of do, and we'll get into that. But she did babysit, which is really odd to me. She was a fantastic babysitter, people would say, around town. Mm-hmm. And that's really weird, because... I mean, obviously, she she murders children later on. So, in her t- teen years, I guess 14, 15, around in there, she was a babysitter. She also babysat this one boy who was 13. And I think one day, I can't remember the boy's name, but one day they wanted to, he asked her, could you go to the lake with me after school? She didn't go. She had to go do something else. But she told him, you know, don't go. By herself, exactly. she would babysit this kid. He was like thirteen, she was fifteen, and that's weird. It is a little strange. Don't They're kind of close like, in age, yeah, but like two years old. Yeah, older. but anyways, so come to find out, the boy actually did go to the lake and he drowned. So she kind of felt like it was her fault because she wasn't there to watch him. Yeah. So that's one like bad thing that happened to her. I guess you could say it was pretty pretty traumatizing. Um. So, Myra, she also, aside from, you know, being a liar and fighting in school and all that, um, she did kind of change at one point. She was a really good writer, and she did really good in school, like, grade-wise. Um, when she was a teen, I think, I think she was, like, 16 or something like that, um, in 1958, she took classes at a Catholic faith school, and uh, she did, like, her first communion, and she decided then that she was, like, gonna get really big into religion. And she started, like, dressing modestly. She would... So, this is really... This is gonna be a serial... Like, she's gonna be a serial killer? Oh, yeah. This does not sound like a serial killer Yeah, story. it doesn't. Um, she was a virgin. She wanted to, like, keep her virginity till she mm-hmm. was you know, had married. She didn't believe in premarital sex. Um, in her late teens, she decided, though, that she was going to kind of change things up a bit. So, after she got out of the Catholic school and she left and then she decided to... Sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, she decided to dye her hair platinum blonde and start wearing, like, heavy makeup and stuff like that, which... Honestly, that was kind of a thing that was going on. That was, like, you know, early 60s. So, you know, women were, like, starting to wear makeup more and stuff like that. Um, The platinum blonde thing was not a good look for her. And she's ugly as homemade sin. Homemade sin. (laughs) Homemade sin. She's really ugly. Like, and I don't feel bad at all for saying that because she's an actual piece of shit. Um, So, yeah. It was not a good look for her, but she started getting attention from guys this way. Mm. I don't know how, but whatever. She started getting attention from men, and I was going to show you a picture of her. There she is. That's her, and that's Ian. She's not too... She looks like a witch. She kind of, like, her nose... Think of uh, the Wicked Witch. I like big noses for some reason. I think they're very attractive. No, she looks like a witch. Anyways, so, and she is. She's a witch. No, she's not a witch, but she's a bitch. She's a witch. <laughs> yeah, I was like, you mean a bitch. Um, anyways, when she was 17, she got engaged to a man named Ronnie Sinclair. Um, but shortly after they were together, like several months, I think, um, they decided that she said that he was too immature for her. He reminded of her, her. He reminded her of her dad because he would come home and he'd have like dirt under his fingernails what? from working all day. And I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. He could have provided for her really well, but whatever. December 1960, she switched a lot of jobs back and forth. She was like a typist, um, but eventually she ended up in Millward. Millward's. Mm, I don't know something, and uh, this is where she met Ian. So, she ended up being a typist for some company, and that's where she met Ian. She claimed that it was love at first sight. However, Ian did not call it love at first sight. Um, um, we'll get into that, but also, like, he didn't really like her, like, at all. And even, like, later on, he says he was never really attracted to her. They were together. 
they had sex, you know, what? they murdered together, yeah. but he was like, yeah, I never really, he didn't really love her. That's weird. It was weird. Um, so let's talk about Ian now. Ian Brady is known as the most hated man in England. Obviously, she's the most hated woman. He's the most hated man. He was born January 2nd, mom's birthday. Oh. <laughs> 1938. A... Sorry, mom. He's a what are they Capricorn. He's Capricorn, yeah. Yes. Um, he was born in Glasgow, Scotland. So he's Scottish. His mother was 19. Her name was Maggie Stewart. Um, and she was an unmarried waitress. So he didn't really know his father. And he says that, like, he never knew him. So, mm -hmm. I think she just got pregnant and just never told the man or, or whatever. Um, a weird thing, though. His mother couldn't really take care of him. She was 19. She was trying to work and take care of him at the same time. It was just hard on her. So, she put an ad in the paper saying that she wanted someone to adopt him. But it was an open adoption. Mm -hmm. And she would pay them. Uh, I think it was one pound a week to watch him and like mm. basically live there. But you know, she still wanted to have she still wanted to have something to do with him. So she wanted to be able to come over every day. She wanted to be able to see him whenever she wanted to, and know that that was his mother. Okay. So and I kind of get it because she was struggling. She yeah. needed to work, but she didn't have anybody to watch him. Sometimes she would have to work nights or both. So, yeah, this was an idea. So, Mary and John Sloan decided to adopt him or do this, like, deal that they had worked out. Um, Ian was four months old when this happened, so they got him pretty early on. Um, he knew that they, like, right off the bat, as he was growing up, he knew that they weren't his real parents and mm -hmm. that that was his mother, um, Maggie. But yeah. he still called... Mary and John, Ma and Da. Oh. Yeah, so mom and dad. Um, but he wasn't the only child. There was they had several other children, and they were kind of poor. Like they weren't like rich or anything. But I guess the money that they were getting from him helped. So she would come over every once in a while. She would come over every day. Hmm. Yeah. Um, he actually said like, and that's the thing. I don't like Ian Brady by no stretch of the imagination, but I like the fact that he doesn't say, this is what, this is the reason I am the way I am. No, like straight yeah. off the bat, and we'll get into it later in part two, but he's like, nah, I just did those things because I hate, you know, I'm evil. I just did it because I'm evil. Mm -hmm. I had nothing attributed. He's like, nothing attributed to me being this way. I just am how I am. He said nothing in my childhood. He's like, actually, my childhood was really kind of awesome. He said that the the people that adopted him or whatever. Yeah. Uh, Mary and John, they spoiled him. And he was like, it's kind of weird because they were not rich. They weren't well off, but they yeah. took care, really good care of me and all my other siblings adopted or, you know. It sounds like him and her have a miss, like. Like they were like, born that way? I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> it's weird. Yeah. I'm saying like, it's weird because they don't know who their mom and dad is kind of like situation like they're both you know because she, her grandmother raised her but well no i mean her house but you know what I'm you're, saying? Oh, you're saying that yeah that is a little i didn't i didn't realize that I, yeah i just yeah I ju that just hit me yeah maybe that's what they bonded over yeah i didn't realize that huh um he loved to write, and he was good in school, just like Myra. He also loved classical music, and he played the piano. His mother um, met a man. Oh, he also played soccer, too, or something like that. Or football. Yeah. <laughs> How they call it. They call it football. Yeah. Um, his mother met a man later on when he was a young teen, and she decided to move to Manchester, um, England. And that's kind of how he ended up there where Myra is. So Ian started playing. At this point, he would talk to his mom every day. But this man was like really good to her and he was really good to Ian. And he even took his last name. So that's how he ended up with the last name Brady because yeah. the man's name was Brady, his last name. So, um, yeah, he was really good to them. So Ian didn't 
get upset that she had to move. And I guess it was something to do with the man um, with his job or something like that. They had to move to Manchester. But he wanted to stay with his siblings. He wanted to stay in the school that he was at. So he tried to give it a shot, just staying there, not going with his mom. But they talked, like, every day. And it's not like she just abandoned him and left. Um, He also, at this point, though, was starting to, like, play with knives. Kind of become, like, a bully. Which, boys playing with knives. I mean, my son has, like, I don't know, seven knives. So, that's not a big deal. But he was becoming a bully in school. And he was making kids, like, fight each other. Like, he would make kids fight each other. Yeah. (coughs) <coughs> it's really, really odd. Um, he admits that there was, well, he, okay. So, he said one time that there was a rumor going around that he tied, I was trying to think of the word, that he tied a boy to a um, tree and put, like, newspaper around his feet and all that and was going to set him on fire. Well, the boy, still to this day, he claims that that actually did happen. His friends stopped him from actually catching him on fire, obviously. The other people that were around. But the other people that were around and Ian said that that didn't happen. They are like, no, that never happened. Ian says that the guy just wanted to, like, say, oh, I'm one of the ones that got away from Ian Brady. But, and I kind of, I don't know who I believe. I'm just going to stay neutral in this position. Because Ian never lies about anything. Like, He's not a liar. I will say that. Yeah. He's, he, if he, he actually gets a thrill out of like telling you, yeah, I did that because he wants to seem more badass, you know? Yeah. But not like in a sense of like, uh, Richard Romero is like telling the Night Stalker was here. Like he's yeah. not that kind of like douche about it. He's just like, yeah, I did that. Like and he so he would have said, yeah, I did that just to get more, I don't know. Clout. <laughs> yeah, more clout. Um, so his first girlfriend was when he was 11. And at an early age, he said that he enjoyed violence when it came to kissing or anything else. I don't think he was doing other stuff at 11. But he said that he would, like, violently kiss someone. Like, to the point where, like, their teeth were knocking, blood was being drawn. Like, yeah, really wow. bad. So, in 1950, his mother married Patrick Brady, the guy that she moved with, and that was how he got that last name. Um, At this point, he is probably early teens and starts doing break-ins with a small gang that he had started. At age 15, he left school. Some people say that he was, like, obsessed with Nazis and, like, all the Nazi stuff, but... He doesn't ever say that he was obsessed with it. He just says that he was interested in it and he would read books about it. But that didn't mean that he was, like, a Nazi or, you know, nothing like that. Yeah. Or that he, like, loved Hitler. Um, him and his gang of thieves got caught because someone snitched on them. And this part's crazy. So, somebody had snitched on them that I guess was in the gang or whatever. Didn't want to be in anymore. Whatever. He waited ten years went to this man's house, went up to the apartment, was about to knock on it and shoot the guy in the head. And he said, luckily, Ian says, at that moment, a woman stepped out and was beating her rug, like, you know, Mm -hmm. beating the dirt off of it over her balcony. And it was in that moment that he realized, I can't shoot this guy. She'll see. I'll go to prison. So he just walked away. He was like, it's so crazy how little things can keep someone alive. And I was like, what wow. the f-? <laughs> So, you know, that guy's got to be, like, later on thinking, I was that guy! <laughs> like, he was probably, like, <laughs> kissing the girl, the woman who was taking yeah. off the rug. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, there's some articles that say that he, around 16 or 17, he started, like, having hallucinations. And psychologists later would diagnose him with paranoid schizophrenia. Yeah, say which kind of makes sense. Yeah. Um... He discovered when he was a teen also that he was bi. And this kind of... Myra discovered then that she was bi too. So, that's kind of Mm -hmm. something they had in common. Um, So, now we're going to talk about them together. Myra was 18. I don't know why I said it the high-pitched. Ian was 23 when they met in 1961. 
like we said before, she was in like she was infatuated with Ian. She would write about him in her diary. I hope he loves me. Mm. We will be married someday. Like that kind of infatuated, almost like to the point of a obsession. She also watched him for months uh, before actually talking to him, and she thought like he was like this cool rebel guy, you know, like this mysterious dude in the background. Um, Ian had explosive outbursts, like at work and people thought he was like crazy kind of he finally made a move on her though at the christmas party they like started dancing and stuff ian and myra would go on um dates together like to the movies and stuff like that brady then gave her like a lot of ian brady he gave her like a lot of material to read and they spent their work lunch breaks reading material about nazis so they would read like nazi books and stuff like that (laughs) great times um so romantic she was um she was concerned about so okay this is another like possible lie she was concerned about brady's character ian's brady's whatever i'm gonna say ian from now on she was concerned about his character and in a letter she wrote to a childhood friend she mentioned an incident where she had been drugged by brady but also wrote of how obsessed she was with him. A few years later, she told the friend to completely destroy the letter. And in her 30,000 word plea for parole back in 1978, spoiler alert, they both go to jail, but we'll get there. This is what she said. Within months, he, talking about Ian, had convinced me that there was no God at all. He could have told me that the earth was flat, the moon was made of green cheese, and the sun rose in the west, and I would have believed him. Such his, such was his power of persuasion. So, she would say, after they got arrested and all that, she would say forever that she really had nothing to do with it. He was like a brainwasher. He was just really good at persuasion. Yeah. He just kind of made her do this stuff. And there were people that believed her. There were people that, like, were like, yeah, I can see that. Like, because of how she was raised and all that. Yeah. But I just want to let you guys know, <laughs> right fucking now, she is a piece of shit. Because in one of the the girl, the little girl that they murder, mm-hmm. I won't go into detail about it, but there's a recording. And in the recording, she's in there, too thoroughly enjoying herself with the torture that they're putting in this little girl through. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, fuck you, Myra. You're a lion hoe. Okay. <laughs> anyway, Hope you hear this. <laughs> Hope you hear this down in hell where you are with Satan. Um, because, yeah, no. Like, they, the recording even had to be played for, like, the girl's family because they had to make sure that that was actually her in okay, the recording. And it was so bad that, like, even the officer was, like, it was, like, the worst. Like, he has nightmares about it. He would have nightmares about it. Mm. Of how bad it was. Because they tortured her, raped her, all this other stuff. And she was 10. So, yeah. You can go <sighs> screw yourself right off. Um, yeah, I, don't, I, I think it would be a lot if somebody could manipulate me to do that to a 10-year-old. Exactly. And also just like not cringe like if she's seeming like she's happy I would understand if she was like standing in the corner and like every time something happens she's like you know looking like she's disturbed maybe I would understand maybe if he was like I'm gonna kill you if you don't do this yeah but no I think even at one point she said that he would threaten her but then she would say later on no he didn't she's just a lying sack of crap anyways she would um say the whole time that they were together he pretty much convinced her that god was not real because he didn't believe in religion like from good day one like he never believed in it um he believed that religion was a lie she said that their first sexual encounter he explained how he liked to be dominating in the bedroom she would have bruises and bite marks all over her and he introduced her basically to bdsm which is perfectly fine yeah um just because you like bdsm doesn't mean you're a psychopath in this case it did. Um, yeah. <laughs> Ian was trying to test... I believe that Ian was trying to test her limits to see how much... She could take. She could take, like, and how much... how Just how obsessed 
she was with him. Like, yeah. okay, if I can do this to her and she doesn't leave me or she doesn't freak out, what more can I say and she'll be okay with it? I will say that she was unhealthily obsessed with him. Especially since the feeling really wasn't reciprocated. Like, people would say he never was like, oh, I love you. Like, no. Yeah. There wasn't anything like that. He basically just used her as, like, the woman he needed to help murder these children and hold them mm-hmm. down while he was doing it. And that's pretty much it. Um, Myra what said... this case called again? The Moore's Murders. The Moore's. So, Myra said that she completely changed herself for him and would always get him, like, whatever he wanted. She also was kind of an enabler because, like I said, she would do, like, whatever he wanted for him, like, constantly. Eventually, they started talking about committing murders. Um, saying that, like, he also would, and they would also say, like, he would say that he wanted to, like, kill children, too. There is a condition for this, however... Where someone can be, come, like, attracted to someone who is a murderer or rapist because they look at them as, like, someone who's very dominating. Which, yeah. obviously, we've seen that because look at Richard Ramirez and all those women. They're like, oh my god, he's so hot. Thank Rape you. me. Yeah. Fucking losers. Anyway, so. <laughs> Standards just a little higher when them come on. Yeah. Um, so, something that... Myra was just crazy as well. Like, it, it's actually called, like, a Bonnie and Clyde type syndrome. Like, that's the nickname for it. But, yeah. however... But he didn't really love her. Like, I feel like she was just obsessed with him. And he was just like, okay, come on. Yeah. He did, however, like, slowly introduce her to things. And yeah. would s- do it slowly to see how far he could push the boundaries. But, but still doesn't make an excuse, you know. For it had mine. no limits. If a boyfriend came up to me and was like, yeah, so I'm murdering someone, I'd be like, I don't care how obsessed. I'd be like, okay, yeah. well, we're not seeing each other anymore. I'm going to call 911. <laughs> exactly. Um, so after one year of their relationship, he confessed that he, like in their relationship, he confessed to her his perfect murder. Like, this is what he wanted to do. He wanted to have her drive a van while he followed closely behind on his motorcycle. He would flash his lights when he saw a certain victim he wanted to pick up. He would flash his lights at the van and she would see. And then one of the victims, like, once the victim was in the van, they would take them to the moors. Like, Myra would be the one to be like, hey, let me get you in the van, you know. Yeah. Then they would come up with some excuse, and then they would drive so them out to the like moors. The trap. She was the yeah, and then they would drive them out to the moors, commit the murder, bury them on the moors. Um. So one thing about this though is, I'm kind of getting ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll I'm getting ahead. Okay, so <clears throat> this was their first murder. So, the first murder was July 12th, 1963. They were ready for their first victim. Uh, She was in the van and he was in a motorcycle. Ian spotted a little girl about seven or eight and he flashed his headlights at Myra. Myra, however, did not stop and Ian was, like, super frustrated when they got, like, up the road and they stopped. And he was like, what the hell did you not stop for? I told you I wanted that girl. Myra said... Uh, that girl was Mary Ruck, or Marie Ruck, I believe. Um, she was a neighbor of her mother's, and she knew her because she had actually also kind of, like, babysit her a few times. So, she was like, that can't happen, and let me explain why. So, they had, like, rules, I guess you could say. And one of the rules was they were not going to kill anyone anyone that they knew because it could be traced back to them. So... She was like, we can't do that because they'll know. They'll ask questions. Also, she's a younger girl and they won't think that she just like ran away or something like that, you know. Yeah. So, they decided to keep driving and they came along their first victim. They found 16-year-old Polly, Pauline Reed, excuse me. Pauline. The crazy thing about this, though, is she literally just did what she wasn't going to do with a seven-year-old because, let me explain, she knew Pauline. Pauline was friends with Maureen, her sister. 
Yeah. So she knew her. We'll get into how. And we'll get into kind of why I think that she did what she did. So Maureen was, I mean, Pauline was on her way to a dance, like some sort of dance. And she pulled up beside her and she was like, hey, where are you going? She said, I'm on my way to a dance. She's like, okay, I'll hop in. I'll give you a ride. Once she was in the car, uh, she, she asked her, um, Myra, she was like, hey, can you help me find this, like, expensive glove that I lost on the moors? Because the moors weren't that far. Yeah. And she was like, yeah, sure. Being that it was her best friend's sister, she was, like, you know, comfortable with her. Yeah. And she was like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I'll go help you. She was like, it's just a really expensive glove and I can't find it. And if I don't find it, you know, it's, it, I guess she probably said my boyfriend's going to be mad or whatever. I don't know. So, Pauline agreed and they were just going to stop by there real quick. So, after they got to the moors, Ian joined them, following close behind. Marine, I mean, Myra told her that he was there, like, she was like, who is this guy? Like, who, she's like, oh, he's my boyfriend. He's just here to help. Ian then led my, led Pauline further into the moors. And Myra claims that she waited at the van. I'm just going to go ahead and say this. Through all these murders, pretty much, Myra is supposedly never there. She waits at the van or she's running a bath, like, with the little girl that, is the awful one. She was like, oh, I was running a bath. I wasn't even in the room when all that was happening. Yet, you're literally on the recording, so shut your fucking mouth. Sorry. Yeah. I can't stand this woman. Um, dude, if I would have been in England, I would have, like, I don't even know what I would have done. I probably would have been one of those that would have, like, murdered her. Like, when she was walking outside yeah. or something. Like, walking outside the courtroom. Um, she said that then Ian came back about 30 minutes later and took Pauline's body, like, she, she, they went, hold on. Excuse <coughs> you. Mm, sorry. She said Ian came back 30 minutes later after walking Pauline into the woods, mm -hmm. and then they went to Pauline. She saw that her body was sitting there, and she just, you know, her, 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 her throat, her, her, th she said, her throat was cut, and she realized that she was dying, and then they buried her. Blah, blah, blah. That's not what actually happened. What actually happened, Ian says, is that, no. He was like, <laughs> and the funny part about it is, and we'll get into it later in, in part two when they're actually, like, in so court. So, he admits that, no, she was there the Oh, yeah, time. yeah. Okay. He's like, uh, no, that's not what happened. She's a liar. This is what happened. So, they both walked her into the woods. They, or into the moors. And then they both, like, she held her down while he raped her. Yeah. The 16-year-old. And then she actually sexually assaulted her as well. Then, <laughs> she said, he says, um, I'm laughing because it's ridiculous how yeah. much she, like, She's lying. totally non-implicated herself into this. And then she just did it so she could try to get parole and, like, get out early. Um, so then what happened was after... He slit her throat, but she had not died yet. So, she was kind of still, like, in and out. She, like, snatched a necklace off of her, and she was like, no, 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 I'm sorry, I'm getting, I'm way off. Hold on. Oh. <laughs> I'm getting excited, because this part's crazy as shit. This reminds me of, like, a movie. Okay. Back up. They rape her. She gets her clothes back on. Then, she snatches a necklace off of her, and it was some necklace that, you know, it her mom gave her or whatever. There was no yeah. significance. But she, Myra said, you're not going to need this where you're going. Ian got pissed because he liked the element of surprise and he didn't like for anybody to know that they were going to die. Yeah. So he slaps Myra in the face. Yeah. Weird. The girl's probably like, what the what heck is going, going on? on? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's, he slaps Myra in the face and then she says, well, this is Pauline Reed. And Ian's like, what? what? Come to find out, Pauline supposedly had, like, a thing going on with her sister's boyfriend, but it was never confirmed that oh, they did. so that's pretty much the reason that's why the she That's the reason picked why her. she picked her, because she thought, this bitch has been cheating on my sister's boyfriend, like, they've been together, and yeah. I'm gonna kill her. Needless to say, Ian was pissed about this, because yeah. they broke their first rule, which was, don't get anybody that we know, anybody that can trace us back to. So he was super upset. 
So then he slits her throat and then he goes and gets the shovel. They bury her in the moors. Um, and Myra claimed when they were on their way back into town that she passed by Pauline's mother and the older brother and that they were searching for her. But they, you know, passed by him. And, but the brother says later on that's probably impossible. She had to be lying about that because they weren't even out there searching for her at that time. So that was just something she, like, threw in there to try to be more maniacal. Whatever. Um, I don't like this girl. She also... So, they got back home. Yeah. Oh, they went to a movie. Excuse me. After the murder. Then they went home. Then they drank a bottle of wine. Had sex. Yada, yada. A couple days later, after this search has went on for this girl, like this massive search, um, Myra actually goes up to Pauline's mother and, like, it's like, oh my god, I'm so sorry that your daughter's missing. That's crazy. Blah, blah, knowing the full well the whole time that she's the one that murdered. Yeah. And also, if yeah. you were innocent, why the fuck would you do that? Exactly. Like, people, people were like, wait, if you were innocent, you knew that he had just, regardless of whether or not you were actually there when the murder occurred. How could you not have the guts? How could you have the guts? How could you have the guts to, have walk, the guts up to walk up? Yeah. If you were really like someone and that be like, was oh being. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. Like, yeah. What? Um, She's. So the rules, like I said, that they had were no picking up, don't pick anybody you know. They were going to have different sets of clothes for each time that they would murder someone. So they would have a different set of clothes. They would burn the ones that they would use like during the murder so there was no evidence. Yeah. They also were going to bury and discard all the objects that they used. So any knives, uh, shovels, they took license plates off of cars. Like he was really... He's actually, like, a genius, to be perfectly honest. He reminds me of Ed Kemper. Like, he's very smart and intelligent, yeah. unfortunately. He could have used his intelligence to be, like, I don't know, a doctor. But he decided yeah. to go another route. Um, so, he actually had a really good idea in doing this. Um, he also took stuff that they couldn't burn or stuff that they couldn't bury. He would put in a bag and take it to a train station and a locker. And he would keep it in a locker, a locked locker. Oh, okay. That's smart. Myra claims that she doesn't ever know what was in the bag, but I'm pretty sure she did, so whatever. So they were a really odd couple. Myra said, is said to have, they had like kind of an open relationship, so she <laughs> is so stupid. She actually started having sex with a cop, like after their first murder. What? Yeah. Ian actually had to like threaten to beat his ass, like if like if you don't leave my girlfriend alone type thing, I'll beat your ass kind of deal. And so he like kind of left. But it's crazy to me. Why would she how sleep much with her? she puts this whole situation into like jeopardy? And he keeps her around. I mean, I know he just keeps her around probably because he needs somebody to hold the kids down, and he yeah. needs somebody that's okay with doing this. It's not like he's gonna find any other girl yeah, that's yeah. gonna be like, yeah, I'll do that for you. But I'm just like, dude, I would have just done it. I would have been like, you know what? We're done. Like, you're an idiot. Okay? But he doesn't. He keeps her around. Yeah, she sleeps with the cop. She then, after this whole scenario and, like, he threatens to beat the cop's ass and all that, she purchases a gun and she threatens Ian with it, which apparently they had, like, fought all the time, so this wasn't unusual. Um, they also would have, like, super, like, hate sex and, like crazy like you know beat each other up type sex or whatever mm -hmm. um they decided during one of these hate sex times that they were gonna get another kid kill another kid so they were like laying there ian says that they were just laying there naked in bed and they were like yeah he was like yeah i want to get another kid to kill and she was like okay sure let's do that and he was like, but this time I need it younger because I don't want to have to struggle like we had to struggle with her because it was too much of a struggle. And she was like, oh, yeah, I totally agree. You know, all this bullshit. So, yeah. Um, a few months later, that was when they found, uh, that was when they committed the murder of John Kilbride. He was a four, he was a 12-year-old boy. Sorry. This was on November 23rd, 1963. He was working at a shop to, like, get more money. Um, Meyer and Ian saw him and approached him and asked him to, like, carry some boxes and stuff like that. Once John was inside the car, Ian said that they would 
have to like take a detour because they told him hey if you help us with these boxes and you help us go find this glove that she's missing they use the glove thing again um we'll give you a bottle of sherry and you can take it back to your parents you know as like a thank you yeah and so he was like okay cool so then they went to the moors and when they reached the moors ian said that he could tell that john was starting to get like really nervous because he wasn't like the type of boy that like would go with people you know especially guys Myra said that she of course again wasn't a part of it and she just stayed in the car Ian however um his story is different so they all went into the moors together like they did last time Mm -hmm. and they both took him to the ground um she held him down while Ian raped him and then killed him. They then buried him on the moors. And this was one of the boys that, like, they took pictures of his body before they before they buried him. Mm-hmm. Um, there was also a massive search for this little boy. John's mother said that later on she would say that she didn't ever tell him, like, to stay away from women. She would always tell him, you know, you need to stay away from men. Don't go anywhere with a man or something like that. But there was a woman. Myra yeah. was the one that was doing it and Ian was just in the car um John was a popular little boy he was like really popular in his school he was in Catholic school he also liked to play soccer football um he also loved movies and he was just all around just like a sweet kid sweet kid yeah they also would take okay so this is the part that I told you about earlier They would take pictures of themselves on the moors. So, where they buried John and all these other kids, they would kind of leave themselves, like, markers, I guess you could say. Like, they would have, like, a big boulder or something like that. Over time, those things got moved, so it was harder to find the bodies. And there was one body that they never found. I'll explain that. But, um, yeah. So, they would go with their dog... I think you saw the picture, like, you know, yeah. the picture of him and her and the dog. Yeah, standing yeah. there. Yeah, they're literally standing on top of a, where they just buried. And they're just, like, ha- and John. also, if she's innocent, why is she smiling and looking exactly. so happy? <laughs> yeah. Like, in yeah. the picture, she's like, come on, honey. Like, just yeah. so happy. Like, what? You're not innocent. Just me and my boyfriend and my dog. Yeah, they would have, like, picnics on the moors. They would even, like, do toasts. Like, they would toast to the dead. Like, they would, he would say that they would go and, like, drink wine and they would toast to whoever, like, John, who they'd killed or somebody like that. And I'm just like, you guys are freaking weirdos. Like, psychopathic. For sure. Um, so yeah, and we'll put some of those pictures up so you guys can see. It's just like, ugh, this is the thought. It's just ridiculous. So June 16th, 1964, they spotted their next victim. This was Keith Bob. Keith Bennett. Sorry. He was walking to his grandmother's house. Um, He had a lot of other siblings, and he was just the most sweet, adorable little cherub-looking child ever. He had glasses, and he was so cute. Yeah, I saw that Yeah, he was a cutie. Um, He loved to collect bugs, and he loved being outside. He loved to collect rocks. He reminded me, like, when I was reading about that, it reminded me of, like, Adeline, how she loves, like, just collect Mm -hmm. rocks and all different kinds of stuff. So, <clears throat> hold on. Oh, he sounds so cute. He sounds like a cutie. And he looked like a cutie, too. Yeah. He looked like Stuart Little. Like yeah, that's, that's who he reminds me of, Stuart Little, yeah. I was trying to think, I was like, who does he remind me of? Stuart Little. Um, according to Myra, they told him to help with boxes again, and they would take him to his grandmother's house afterwards. Once in the van, they drove to the moors, they used the glove trick again, and Ian says he wants. Ian says though that he wasn't in the van; that he was waiting like down the street, which kind of makes more sense because if he was in the van, why would a kid get in the van and be okay? Like they would just be like, "Oh no, I'm gonna get out." So yeah. he always says that he was never anywhere around whenever she was doing what she needed to do. I kind of believe it. I don't really care. It doesn't matter. Um. Of course, Myra says once again she was never there. He took them into the woods, did the thing, whatever. Um, so, 
Oh, sorry. I went too far on my notes. Hold on. Use your words. Talk, but oh, I'm me. lost. Oh, sorry. Uh, Use your words. I was like, me? What? What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um. So he was at the cemetery? He's like he was waiting at the cemetery? You mean at the moors? At the moors? Sorry. Yeah. No, he says he was waiting down the street, and then he, like, hopped in the car once they got down the road. Okay. And so... She wasn't there? Where was she? No, she was there. She was driving. Oh, oh okay. Okay, I'm, I, I found my spot. So, Ian... Yeah. So, they get to the moors, and Ian says that they went, like, three miles deep into the moors. Um, this part's fucking awful. So, Keith was nervous, and he kept saying that he was worried that his grandmother was going to wonder where he was. And Myra kept telling him, don't worry, you'll be home soon. Uh, Ian said that they, the sign, okay, so they had like signs that they would, this is really freaking creepy. There was tons of different songs that they would hum to each other, like if they were out in public, like if, like if me and you were yeah. like in a restaurant and we started humming a song together. Or you started humming a song, and then I started humming it. It would be yeah. because we knew that that was the song that we hummed when they killed when we killed somebody. So fucking weird. Yeah, weird. So, so one of they the hummed the song to like the kid. Well, no, one of the that. thing. So, Ian, one of the signs for this kid was he started whistling "When You Wish Upon a Star," and no! that was <laughs> not that. Song. Let me ruin that song for no! you, real quick. Let me ruin that song for you real quick. Oh. So they started whistling. He started whistling that, and that was the signal to, like, take this kid down. So, um, they did. They <sighs> killed Every him. Every time I hear that song now. Thanks, Amanda. You're welcome. They took him down to the ground, did what they did to John, and then they buried him. Uh, Keith's body, unfortunately, was one that's never found to this day. They've never found it. Mm. He also took pictures of Keith while he was laying on the ground um, the stepdad was actually, unfortunately, a suspect in this case, but there was no evidence, and they didn't accuse him, like, later on. Um, but, yeah, so, excuse me, whew, I got the hiccups. So, what was I gonna say? Oh, oh. also, to, like, one thing that's fucked up about Ian is he claims that he doesn't know where um Keith's body is but at the same time he he would say little snarky things to like law enforcement and he'd be like oh wow I can't believe the metal detectors didn't find that didn't find him because you know that thing on his jacket like the zipper on his jacket because they like buried him in his yeah. clothes but I'm sitting there thinking what if they didn't bury him in his clothes like what if they burned that and that was just his way of being an asshole that would be yeah Myra later would say that she saw these kids as, like, in her eyes, she saw these kids as lambs that were walking to their slaughter because she would watch them walk with Ian. Ian puts, um, like, he was walking them, like, she, you know, they were both walking them to their death. And, like, it was a great thing, you know, or whatever. I don't know. It's weird. So that is where we're gonna stop today, because we're fifty. Like mi- we're fifty three minutes in. They sound. They sound like douchebags and like they are. Uh, They're pretty awful. And thing. the next one that we're gonna talk about is Leslie Ann Downey, and she's the ten year old that they recorded, and it's really bad. Like I will. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to say one thing that she says, and I'll probably mention it again. But in the recording, you can hear her say, I want my mommy. Oh. Yeah. And, like, that give, that gives me chills and makes me want to cry. Yeah. <laughs> because it's just, like, how can you, how can do you that. do that yeah. to anyone, the little only kid? But, um, yeah, they're pretty awful, terrible humans. Oh, I'll say another thing, just a little tidbit for next episode, too. Um, when they're in court, literally all she keeps caring about, because for some reason they're in court together, like at the same time, and they're like right beside each other, she keeps asking him constantly, does my hair look okay? 
Yeah. What? She's that kind of bitch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're being convicted to yeah. murder, sweetie. I don't think she, no like, one cares about your they, fucking hair. During court, they'll like, they would like, um, like whisper to each other and like laugh with each other and stuff. Just like shit. Like, complete shit bags. Like, by the time this is over with, you're gonna be like, I literally hate these. Like, I wanna just go to hell for a moment so I can be like, ha! You're getting what you deserve. Alright, bye! And then yeah. go to hell. <laughs> like, Make sure to put a pineapple up their ass. Thank yeah. <laughs> because they're the worst human beings on planet Earth. Like, they, I can't even. Like, I already don't like them. Yeah. I really don't like that woman. It's really bad. It's not even like a cute Bonnie and Clyde situation at this point. Mm. It's just like a you guys are just evil evil pieces of shit yeah. like yeah anyway so yeah that is part one and we will have part two maybe wednesday we could do it wednesday yeah i'm gonna get a lot of cases done this weekend like i want to go ahead and because i already have another one that and i just want to have some lined up for like if i ever get sick maybe i can just like send you the script and you could do one yeah or, you know, something like that. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. I don't think we have anything else to talk about either. Um, so we'll see you guys Wednesday and then Friday, you know, we'll do some more. Oh, we did get a comment on one of our videos. Um, and the, I believe it was a girl, maybe it was a guy, I don't know, the person asked if we would do Rodney Reed. And I didn't know about that case, but I started reading into it. It's pretty interesting. So we might do that one. Um, I don't know. That. I don't think I know the case. I believe it... I didn't read fully into it, but I know that he's like... They they commented on the uh, Scott Peterson case. Yeah. About whether he was convicted or not. Or whether he was guilty or not. Yeah. And um, so that's kind of like another situation. Like this guy... There's a lot of people that think he's innocent, and there's some people think he's guilty, so mm. it was kind of that situation. But I don't think it was his wife or girlfriend, maybe? I don't know. I didn't read that much into it. I just kind of saw, like, the cliff notes of Google, yeah. I guess you could say. Okay. So, anyways. All right, guys. Well, we hope that you have a fantastic day, and um, stay tuned for part two. Please watch part two, or listen to part two, because we have a lot of times people will just listen to part one and not part two. And I know it sucks, but you got to come back for this one because the next victims I'm going to talk about, I really want their story out there. Plus, I want you guys to hear, like, the whole situation of them being in court because it's crazy. And I want everybody to hate them as much as I do. Yeah. So, anyways. <laughs> let's bond with that. <laughs> let's bond with that. All right. We'll see you guys later. Bye. Bye.